science enthusiasts. Welcome to Spaces Unleashed. Every week on Twitter, we bring an expert to chat live through the Spaces program. And this is bonus content that goes with the Science Podcast. We hope you enjoy the show. All right, Dr. Lear, are you good to go? I am. All right, I've got a sound effect for that. I need, I need to be faster. <laughs> I need to be faster on my uh, soundboard. All right, there we go. <laughs> I like it. So the first question is, where are you calling into the podcast from? Where are you in the world? So I am now in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I think the the last time we spoke, I was in Athens, Georgia, yes, uh, yep. working on my PhD at the University of Georgia, but moved out to Colorado. All right. Okay. Now you, you have a doctorate now, and I introduced you as a, a bat scientist. Um, yep. I think, I think there's a little bit more to it than, than that. Uh, yes. could, could you tell everybody what your, what your education is like? What's your background in science to be Dr. Kristen Lear, bat scientist? Yeah. So I, I am a bat scientist, but I focus on bat conservation. So mm-hmm. I particularly work on conserving species, um, both endangered species, as well as, you know, general bat species around the world. Um, and so I, studied zoology as an undergrad, um, kind of got my, my bachelor of arts in zoology and then got my PhD in integrative conservation at the university of Georgia. Um, so I was learning a lot about bats, but also a lot about people, um, a lot about how we work with people to do conservation mm-hmm. in ways that, you know, best protect the bats, but also can benefit people. Right. So, um, yeah, kind of uh, more on the social side of things and just, you know, doing doing science, quote unquote. I love it. So you, when we talked on the podcast, you, you are all in for science. What yep. what got you into science as a, a young person? Like this is a, to get a PhD is not for the faint of heart. It's a, it's no. a, it's a journey. <laughs> and I have such yes. respect for people that like yourself. What, yes. what got you into science? Yeah, I... So I, I will say it did take me six and a half years to get my PhD, which may seem like a long time, but in um, ecology type uh, PhDs, that's, you know, four to six years is pretty average. So, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I was fine taking longer because I really wanted to do a good job. So um, it definitely is a commitment, but I kind of knew growing up um, that I wanted to work with animals. You know, I'm a huge animal nerd and grew up, you know, volunteering at the animal shelter, walking the dogs and, um, getting into science. I, I just remember doing science experiments with my mom. Like we would collect, um, things out in nature and, you know, make little chemistry kits out of them. And I just did that all growing up. Um, and so I just really had that mindset of, of exploring and kind of investigating and poking around. Um, and then in, sixth grade, I actually got my start in bat conservation unofficially when I built bat houses for my Girl Scout Silver Award project. Oh, yay. Yeah. So that was like, I I didn't know then that I, you know, quite wanted to go on to a PhD, you know, at that time I was 12. But um, I really loved bats. I loved watching them fly around at night. Uh, we would go on night hikes with my Girl Scout troop, you know, during summer camp and you could see the bats flying around. So I was just really drawn to them from that young age. And I think that's what that spark is what carried on into college and then, you know, after. So you were never the kid that was shy of bats because that's probably no. we're going to get into that in a little bit. But um, yep. they're, they're, people are very scared of bats. There's some people that are terrified of them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, I was always the creepy crawlies, like spiders and snakes and bats and rats. I had pet rats growing up, um, best pets ever. <laughs> so, yeah, I just I just was drawn to those animals that other people kind of shied away from, and I wanted to do something to help them because I mm-hmm. thought they need to do why you know why are we focusing on just the cute and cuddly? And bats are cute and cuddly. I this think, is but. true. I, yeah, well, I will go to bat for you that um, some of the bats we talked about on the podcast, I googled them. And they yeah. are adorable. They are so cute. <laughs> they are. I mean, the, the hashtag sky puppies. I mean, like, it's there for a reason because some of these bats are quite adorable. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I think everybody agrees that all dogs are adorable, but I've seen some 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 that are like, Ooh, 
Um, but <laughs> <laughs> anyways, probably the yep. same, probably the same with bats. There's some cuter yeah. ones than others. Definitely. <laughs> so can you, um, I would like you just to talk to us about what you do with, uh, bat research. Like what do you do with bats and conservation? Um, what did you, what do you study with that? Yeah. So there's, gosh, there's so much you can study with bats, which is one of the reasons why they're so cool. But, uh, right now I work at bat conservation international, um, kind of actually my dream job. I really, when I was an undergrad doing my first like bat research project, my dream was to work at BCI. Um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And at Bat Conservation International, I lead our agave restoration initiative, where we are restoring and planting agave plants, which, you know, we all know and love from tequila and mezcal, which is where we get those products from. Um, and we're restoring those, those plants to the landscape uh, for pollinating bats that are threatened or endangered. So we're working across the U.S. Southwest and Mexico to restore these agaves for both bats and for people um, who harvest and use agaves. So that's, that's an interesting point. You, you mentioned a term pollinating bat. Could yes. you, could, some people may not realize that's even a thing. Could you explain a bit of that? Yeah. So I really think bats are under, under known about how they can pollinate plants. So there are hundreds of plants around the world that are bat pollinated, just like, you know, when we see hummingbirds out, you know, drinking nectar from flowers or butterflies or moths, those are pollinators. Bees, right? Save the pollinators um, is, is typically thought of with these insects and birds. But bats are hugely important pollinators of many plants around the world, including agave plants. Um, really, without bat pollination, we would not have these agave species and we would not have tequila and mezcal. Um, so they're very, very important to protect. Um, Chris is my co-host. She's my, she's my wife. Chris, would you be sad if there was no more tequila? Um, no, but <laughs> I know there are some people that would be, so I would be sad for them. There you yeah. Go. Yeah. Um, I, think I, yeah, I'm not a huge liquor drinker, but I think my favorite are those like smokier mezcals and like cocktails. So I would definitely be sad without the bats. I just would be sad without the bats because I love them. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you see the value even when they're, <laughs> if you don't like the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see the value 100%. And yeah. so with their pollination, um, do they pollinate night plants then? Like, because they travel at night or is that a, is that a misconception? Yeah, so that's actually most mostly true. So most bats are are nocturnal. Um, and so, yes, they're, they're pollinating these night blooming flowers that open at night. Um, they have... Night blooming flowers tend to have certain characteristics. Um, they're pale in color, like white or yellow. They tend to be a little more pungent smelling to attract the nocturnal pollinators. Um, and they have a ton of nectar, which feeds the, the bats and other you know nocturnal pollinators. Um, but there are some bat species around the world, like um, the flying foxes that you see um, in Australia, that they're more like diurnal, well, they're more in the evening, in the morning um, out and they're they're eating nectar from flowers or they're eating the flowers and pollinating during that time. So it's kind of a mix. With your research, Kristen, you had to you had to catch bats, right? Yeah. So part part of my research, I was working in Mexico, um, northeast Mexico, where we were working outside these bat caves that have these endangered pollinating bats. The Mexican long nosed bat is their name. Um, and yeah, we would catch them, um, and which is quite fun to, you know, get to see them up close. But I was also using um, infrared cameras to watch them feeding on agaves at night. So got to use some really cool technology to, to kind of spy on them. So how do you catch them? Like, do they... Do, yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you... <laughs> Kind of a, with a net, a, like with a butterfly yeah. net, like um, I imagine it's sort of, sort of? okay. <laughs> yeah, so they're called mist nets. So basically it's like a 30 foot long giant hair net is kind of what they look like. They're kind of that hair net material, very um, dark, like black filaments that are very thin. And you stretch out this net usually at like the, in, in the flyway of where you see bats flying or like outside the entrance of a cave. So they, they fly into the net when they're 
you know, flying and they don't see the net in time um, and they get tangled up in them. So that's how we, you know, get to catch them. And then we take them very carefully out of the net so that, you know, they don't get injured and then we can, you know, weigh them and measure them and do all that stuff before letting them go. So do you band them? Like, is it a banding program where you, you track their movement? Yeah, so that's, I wasn't really doing that, um, but people definitely do ban bats, like you ban birds. It's a little bit different with bats because you don't put the band on the foot like you do with birds. You put it on their arm, on their wing bone. Um, so it's a bit different, but um, same kind of concept. Do they get bat backpacks like some of the birds do? <laughs> Yeah, sometimes. What? So, a bat yeah, backpack. It, well, they have to be big <laughs> enough because you don't want to like weigh down the animal too much. So right, it's okay. most flying foxes that get like the mostly collars. But yeah, they can be the, the transmitter collars or the GPS collars. Um, the bats we were working with, the Mexican long-nosed bats, they don't really weigh enough to to put those heavy things on. So we don't we don't do that. We don't want to, you know be a hindrance to them. So for people on mobile, I've put a picture of the Mexican long nose bat into the nest. Um, it's that little thing up at the top there. I got, I just Googled it. It's sourced from bat conservation international. They're adorable. These are the ones we talked about on the podcast. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they're so there's, Oh my gosh. I don't even know where to begin with like how cool bats look. Oh, there it is. I see it now. You see that? Yep. That's one of the ones we talked. That's the, that's one of the Mexican. Yep. Okay, sure. Yep. That's it. And you can see, oh, they're so cute. They um, have a little uh, nose leaf. You can see that little thing sticking up over its nose or over its mouth. It's called a nose leaf. Um, and they use that to help echolocate. It helps direct their echolocation call um, so that they can hear and, you know, navigate better. Um, yeah. And they have cute little eyes. All bats have eyes and all bats can see. So that's one of those myths I know we were going to talk about. The blind as a bat is definitely a myth, but, um, yeah, pretty cute. Well, let's, um, uh, let's move into some of the myths about, about bats, yeah. bats, bats, uh, sorry, doing this live when you misspeak, sometimes it's silly. Um, so just, a, just a quick story, uh, at, hmm, at my school, when we do startup, there's all of the teachers go to the gym and then there's like speeches by the big wigs. And for the last two startups, there's been a bat that has scared people like there's bats in the gym over the summer and they start flitting about. And then some people, they lose their they lose their mind like they are absolutely terrified of the mm -hmm. bat. And is that one of the myths like a bat will get in your hair yeah. or come after you or something like that? Yes, that is definitely a myth. Um, I will, I don't want to discount anyone's experiences with bats. Cause like there definitely have been times when, you know, if you're sitting outside of, I don't know, Carlsbad caverns and there's 40,000 bats coming out, there is a chance that, you know, one of the baby bats that's learning how to fly might accidentally run into you. Um, so I, I have heard those stories and I don't want to discount those, but Bats, you know, they're just like birds. They're flying around. They're outside. They're eating, um, you know, insects as they're flying. And sometimes they do get stuck inside a building, right? Like they either accidentally find their way in and can't find their way out. And so they're, they're trying to get out. But it's, you know, when there's a lot of people yelling and screaming, it, it's hard for them to be able to find their way out. Um, so, yeah, they're I mean, they're just normal animals. They're not trying to attack you or anything. Right. And there is a chance they could get in your hair, I guess, in that situation. Like if you had hair like Marge Simpson, you know, like it's right, yeah. Yeah, five, five feet tall and built like a cactus yeah. or something like that. Okay. Exactly. But bats are very, <laughs> very good. Like they're very maneuverable. Um, they're, if you just Google like bat flight, I mean, their their wings are super maneuverable. So they're very agile and also um, they're able to navigate really well. So that's very rare that that would happen. Yeah. And uh, is it true? This is maybe a myth that they, their wings are their hands. That is actually true. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about that? Dr. Lear? Yeah, they, the, the Latin chiroptera, um, the, the scientific name is hand wing is what it means. Um, and so, yeah, they actually, if you think of, if you put out your arm and you, you know, stretch out your fingers, 
if you imagine your fingers growing about three feet long, each finger about three feet long, and then there would be a really thin kind of stretchy membrane that would stretch between your arm, your those long fingers, and then kind of the side of your body. And that's what makes up the wing. So they, yeah, they basically fly with their really long arm and their really long fingers, which is pretty crazy. I sometimes see their skeleton, you know, on pictures yeah. and it's just, it's, you have to just sit there and just wonder at it. Like it's amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling. <laughs> it is. I, I, I wish we could fly, you know, like you see the <laughs> yeah. old drawings of like people trying to learn how to fly and yeah. it looks kind of like a bat, right? Those, yeah. those contractions cause it works. Well, maybe not for us, but I like for the them ones that are like obviously steam powered on the back and they're yeah. like, wumpo, wumpo, like they're going up and yeah. down as they <laughs> jump off of like a small cliff and it just crashes. So yeah, not, maybe not so good for us to do. Right. <laughs> we'll leave it to the, yeah. the animals that have evolved to fly. Um, exactly. So here's another question myth that maybe people are thinking about. And when mm-hmm. it's question time, maybe there's some I haven't thought about. And that's yeah. rabies and bats. Like you had mm-hmm. to work very closely with bats and, and, and handle them, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. is, what's the deal with rabies and bats? Yeah, rabies. So rabies can happen in, in mammals and, and bats are mammals. Um, and so we do get vaccinated against rabies when we're handling bats because, you know, they can be a vector species. But it's estimated that less than one half of one percent of wild bats carry rabies um, and have it. And so it's, it's not something that you're going to have to worry about unless you're, you know, picking up bats or any really any wild animal. Um, it's actually more common to find raccoons and foxes that have rabies than bats. Um, but that's why, you know, we, we definitely stress that if you find an animal, any wild animal like on the ground, um, if it looks like it could be injured or sick, you know, don't handle it. Don't pick it up. Um, because that's when any contact can happen, right? The animal gets scared and it might try to bite because it's scared. Um, so if you just avoid that direct contact, you're completely fine. Um, we can have bats and birds, you know, in our yards, in our attics, and it doesn't cause problems. Yeah, I think, I think if you just look at a raccoon, they kind of look like they already have rabies to start with. No, I'm, (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I, I love I, I, they're they are adorable too. They are. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's definitely, you know, just using common sense. And if you do find an injured bat or an injured animal, you know, you want to kind of put a shoebox over it to keep it from getting away. And then you can call your local, um, if there's a local animal rehabber or your state uh, wildlife agency that mm. can point you on where to, you know, where to take it or what to do with it. But, you know, don't, don't touch it barehanded. <laughs> Oh, sorry. That was uh, Bunsen is uh, trying to play with my son. So just one second Aww. here, Adam. I like the the guest appearance. <laughs> yeah, they will chime in occasionally. Um, <laughs> uh, two more two more questions before we maybe start to open it up. The the last this one is just a second. There's a battle royale between Bunsen and Beaker right now. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's the problem with the live show. Okay, I, I like it. It adds add authenticity, I think. <laughs> She's like pulling on his leash now, so or his uh, his collar. Um, I lost my train of thought because there are dogs that are fighting. Okay, back back to the <laughs> yes, Bunsen. You, you had two more questions that you were going to ask. Yeah, one was one was really good. Oh yeah, okay. So um, we talked about how bats are. Most people don't think they're a pollinating species. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the other things that bats do that the, we may not think about? that are critical slash important slash neat? Great question. Mm. So there, that's a great lead in also to bat diversity. There are over 1,400 species of bats around the world. So if you think about how many different types of bats that is, you can imagine that they do and eat and behave a lot of different ways and do different things. So um, the like I was saying with the nectar feeding bats, you know they're very important pollinators for things like agaves and bananas, mangoes, cacao, which we use to make chocolate. Um, all of those things are bat pollinated. So again, having bats around is really important for keeping those things around. Um, but around the U.S., the majority of bats we have here um, in North America are insect eating species. So they're eating things like 
moths and beetles, uh, some of which are insect pests. They're agricultural pests. They destroy our cotton crops, our corn, our pecan crops. And so having those bats around eating those insects can help protect those crops. Um, and even just the presence of bats in an area like over a, an agricultural field can actually reduce the amount of insect activity. Even just the, the insects can hear the bats echolocation calls and they'll reduce their activities, their activity. So just having the bats around on your farm can help reduce that crop damage, which is you know awesome for, for us at the store. Um, the farmers don't have to use as, mu- as many pesticides. It's just a great, great thing to have around these bats. Um, and then around the world, there are bats that eat fruit. Um, and those fruit eating bats will often ingest the seeds of the fruits and then either spit those those seeds out or later poop them out. Um, and then those seeds grow into new plants. So those bats are helping regrow and regenerate places like tropical rainforests. It's like a prepackaged um, fertilized seed it already ready to go. <laughs> it is. And some of these plants, like going through the digestive system, actually helps them germinate, um, which is kind of crazy. You know what? Not once has our front lawn grown a stuffed animal because Bunsen and Beaker have left many a (laughs) prepackaged. Yeah. Hmm. Probably a good thing. Wouldn't want so many uh, stuffed animals around, probably. Well, it's mostly from Beaker. She shreds them and then eats some of the fluff. So, sorry. (laughs) Got us derailed there. (laughs) But yeah, imagine that's exactly what bats are doing with the fruit. You know, they're pooping out those seeds and <laughs> helping the rainforest regenerate. So again, pretty awesome to have those bats around. Yeah, I, Canada geese do that too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're terrible. Oh. I don't want to talk about them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they're so good. Is Elizabeth Bourgeois is here? She's gonna get. She's gonna tell me they're amazing if she's here. Oh, she's not. I can trash talk the Canada geese. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love the geese, but man, that yeah, the copious they're, amount. They're aggressive. Yeah, they yeah. can't, they can be, um, <laughs> two, I, I actually have two more questions. I'm looking at my list here. Yeah. I got a little distracted because there was, um, you know, an apocalyptic dog fight right beneath my feet. Um, <laughs> one is on your bio, uh, you, it says you are an, if then she can ambassador. And yes. I, I thought, I, you know, I think that's important for me to ask you what that is. And then for you to explain to that to everybody. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up. So the If Then program or the If Then initiative is a a national initiative to bring to light the contributions of women in STEM who are, you know, currently alive and working um, in a variety of STEM fields and to really create this culture shift where we can encourage girls at a young age to enter and be interested in science and STEM fields. Um, And that's, I mean, it means a lot to me personally, because that's really how I got my start in, you know, in science is when I was a kid doing these, these fun activities and seeing role models like Jane Goodall out there and doing the work that someday I wanted to do. And so as an if then ambassador, I get to serve as that role model and help ignite that that spark in younger girls. Um, And it just, yeah, means the world to me. Do you go to schools or do the, the kids come to you? And then Um, like, what do you, do you do talks with them? I'm just really curious. Yeah. Yeah. So I do a lot. Um, I mean, COVID has obviously put a damper on like in-person stuff recently, Mm. but, um, yes, I do school presentations, obviously bats are, you know, my focus, my passion, um, but do school group activities, uh, scout groups. I have done a lot of mentoring of um, particularly Girl Scout troops who are trying to work on their bronze awards or their silver or gold awards. And they, you know, want to do their own bat project or bat house project. And so, you know, I get to serve as a mentor now um, to help them with their own projects. Um, Yeah, I do a lot virtually, you know, a lot with Zoom and Skype and all these cool platforms. We can now connect to schools and and students all around the world, which is really a cool opportunity. So, yeah, I get to do a lot of virtual presentations and, you know, bat wing building, um, puppet making, arts and crafts about bats and lots of lots of fun stuff. I love it. And then these these kids, they they see you and you're this bat biologist and they see themselves in you and they know it's possible. And I think yeah. that's so important. So cool. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I think when you say, you know, I I'm 
I, I work with bats in my career. I, I'm a bat conservationist. Like all the time people are like, wait, you can have an entire career just <laughs> working with bats? Like I, I think it, it blows people's minds. And I, that's what I want to show is that yes, yes, you can. And even within bats, there's so many things you can do. Um, you know, you can be a lab scientist and, and do, you know, answer scientific questions. You can be a field biologist. You can be a science communicator and an educator and just talk and share about bats. Mm -hmm. You can work with people and be a conservationist. I mean, there's so many avenues to work with bats. And, and if people check out your bio, like you have, you have some really cool accolades. Like you work with National Geographic. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. did you do a TED Talk? I think, did you do a TED Talk? Or no, you, but I... Or you did some big presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, that's wrong. Yeah, I, Ted, I, Ted is on my radar. I'd love Yay. to see someday. Oh, I'm so excited for you if that happens. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe someday. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I actually got to attend the, was it 2019 National Geographic Explorers Festival. Right. Uh, because I got a grant uh, to support my PhD work from Nat Geo. And yeah, I got to give a, a what was it, a 60-second lightning talk about my research on the on stage in front of like hundreds of people in DC, Aww. which terrifying, but also super awesome. That is so awesome. Well, you're, yeah. you are an excellent speaker, but I know what it's like getting in front of a giant oh, yeah. crowd. It's kind of terrifying. It's, um, I never, <laughs> and I teach for a living. I'm in front of people my entire day. So, but yeah. they're, but they're, you know, they're children. Well, they're teenagers. I teach high school. Anyways. Um, That's the the middle school and high school, I think, are the hardest. Yeah, that's funny. Hey, um, I was on the podcast. I talked to uh, Emily Calandrelli, and that's the age group she's terrified of the most is middle school kids. <laughs> <laughs> and she's she has her own, she had her own Netflix show. So you know, anyways. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, the last question for you, Doctor, is uh, could you share a little bit about some of the pets you've had in your life? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. So I, I grew up with um, cats. You know, it was our, like, family pets. We had a, had dogs occasionally, but mostly mostly cats. But I think my kind of claim to fame is I had pet rats um, starting, I think it was starting in fifth grade or sixth grade when I actually got them. Um, and it was a funny story, my, my path to getting rats, because I, in third grade in Mr. Ledger's class, we had moose tracks and he was our class pet. He was this big, like honking albino white, you know, rat. And he, one time he bit me through the cage. Like I was feeding him, which you're not supposed to do through the cage. And he bit me and I was terrified of moose tracks. So I don't know why I then went from that to then like two years later begging my parents to get rats. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they eventually caved and let me get them. And I had over 20 rats throughout middle school and high school uh, before heading off to college. And they were the best pets ever. So I love I love pet rats. They're way smarter than people think. I think we talked about that yeah. on the podcast. Like they're they're not dumb animals. Mm -mm. They mm -hmm. are, you can train, I never actually train rats, but if I ever get them as an adult, I definitely will I'll train them to do tricks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Hey everybody. Thanks for listening to our show week after week. If you want to know how to support the science podcast, here are a couple ways. It's always going to be free to download. So you'll never have to worry about paying for it, but you know, things do cost money running a podcast and, and here are a couple ways you could help us out. One is join our Patreon page. It's amazing. It's growing. It's almost like an extended family. There's multiple tiers of support and we have lots of fun perks for being part of our Patreon page. The other way you could support us is giving us an awesome review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, anywhere you can rate our podcast. Give us a great review. The third way you could support the show is checking out the BunsenBurnerBMD.com website. We have awesome merch there. We worked really hard finding quality merchandise that's comfortable with vibrant colors. And you'll find in limited quantities over the next couple months, maybe even less, the 2022 Bunsen and Beaker calendar. So three ways to support us, the Patreon page. Two, give us a great review. Three, head over to our merch stop and see if there's anything there you'd like. Thanks, everybody. Well, if you are joining us for Spaces Unleashed, we have Dr. Kristen Lear, who is a bat scientist with us. We've just concluded the interview section. 
Um, thanks for get, talking about your life and your research and some stuff about bats. And yeah, yeah and if you're okay, we're going to open up the floor to questions from our audience. Um, that sounds great. And we'll try to keep it on point with bats. Um, is there anything else you could answer? Um, about conservation maybe if people yeah conservation you know working with people and bats and women in stem all that stuff perfect okay so uh we're gonna go to the labrador farm and then to liz so labrador farm you're up first and then liz go ahead good there, christian um uh, one of the interesting things that i've, I've personally learned about bats was funnily enough from a, a tiktok actually um about the uh, mustached bat and its Doppler compensation effect um, and how they found out about the Doppler compensation. Um, fascinating story if you get if anyone gets a chance to check it out. But my question for you is, what is the most interesting fact that you've learned in your research? Mm. Ooh. Oh, this is always a hard one. Wait, because... wait, I'll, let, I'll give you here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <Okay>. sorry, Doctor Lear. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you for that time. That was good. Okay, good time. I thought I thought that would help. There are so many cool bat facts, but and I didn't specifically learn this fact in my my own research particularly. But um, so the the Mexican long nosed bat that I work with, um, or currently work with, and did for my PhD, they. Um, the roost that I was working with was a maternity roost. So they, that's where the moms give birth to their one pup per year. Um, and they, they raise their baby. And so I think one of my favorite bat facts is the fact that baby bats, when they're born can be up to a third of the mom's body weight when it's born. So that would be like a human mom giving birth to a toddler, which is pretty crazy. And then also bat moms can fly with their baby hanging on to them until the baby is about half of the mom's body weight. Um, so they're just bat moms are super moms. They are fantastically strong and very, very good mothers. So I think that's a really cool fact. That's awesome. They are, yeah. cha- I, they are absolute champs. Around. Holy man. I know. Like I can't imagine flying with this like giant pup. I mean, just Google <laughs> bat with, like mom with pop and they're huge and they're still able to fly with them. Pretty crazy. Yeah. I remember carrying my kids on my shoulders and that gets tired after a while and they're small. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Thank you. Good question. Yeah. That was a great question. Thanks. Labrador farm uh, over to Liz and then to Ramona. Good evening. Um, I was just going to point out, speaking of Canadian geese, I had to sit on the road today while three of them stood in the road and stared me down. So if you can come get your creatures, that would be awesome. No, you can, um, you can keep them for as long as you want where they can stay there. <laughs> anyway, well, congrats, Dr. Lear. That is super awesome. Thank you. Um, so just to confirm, if I get bitten by a bat, I don't turn into a vampire or get superpowers? Correct. Yes. I, that would be kind of cool if you got superpowers. What is it? That new Morbius, right? That new movie that's Morbius. You're right. Very good. Yep. I haven't seen it, but um, no, you do not, not turn into a vampire or get superpowers, which would be kind of cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, then Hollywood lied to me. Um, but on a serious <laughs> note, so I live close enough to like national parks. I have tons of trees. I have bats everywhere around my place and so you said that they eat critters and that's cool i wish they would eat mice but is there (laughs) anything that i can do to make my area more palpable for them yeah definitely because they're they're kind of cool i mean they're screechy but you know (laughs) oh yeah yeah that i I would (laughs) highly recommend uh yeah creating bat habitat so some of the things that you can do um around here you know where we have these insectivorous bats is you can plant a bat garden, which sounds pretty cool because it it is cool. Uh, You basically would, uh, if you have a garden, you can plant night blooming flowers that will open at night and attract nocturnal insects that the bats can then feast on. So you'll have your own little kind of ecosystem in your yard. Um, If you're able to, you can create a body of water, um, you know, like a stream or a pond where the bats can drink because they do swoop down over you know lakes and ponds and things to get drinks uh so water for bats is really important 
Um, part of the work that we do at Bat Conservation International is uh, water for wildlife, especially in the Southwest where it's really dry. Um, and there are things like livestock tanks, you know, for water, troughs of water. Um, if you make those tanks, um, those open air tanks lar- large enough and long enough, the bats can actually swoop down and get drinks too. So you can make what? bat-friendly really? water tanks. Yeah, yes. So, you know, if you're a rancher or you're a farmer and you have um, these these tanks, you can make them bat-friendly, which is pretty cool. Um, and they, you know, benefit your livestock as well as bats. Um, you can put up bat houses. And, you know, bat houses are kind of hit or miss sometimes. Like, I know lots of people put them up and then never get bats and they get frustrated. But um, bat houses can be really beneficial um, in areas where they're losing their natural habitat. Um, and they need kind of different roost options. So definitely check out um, Bat Conservation International. We have um, kind of tips on bat houses or bat boxes. Um, and there's lots of good information online too. But but yeah, just generally making your, your habitat bat friendly is a, is a great thing to do. Awesome. I will look into that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the uh, being bat, uh, bat supporter. I love it. Great question, Liz. I never thought about bats drinking water until yeah. right this second. Like I just assumed they never ever had a slurp of water in their life. And now I'm like thinking of these bats, like, like a water bomber fills up on a lake, right? They kind of like, Shoo, and then they just take a little slurp as they go. Um, it kind of is. You'll hear people um, say, Oh, I have a bat in my pool. Like outside because <laughs> oh they, they, they'll, it's really sad because what happens oh. is they, um, They'll swoop down and sometimes they might uh, get too covered in water. They might accidentally miss and um, they'll fall in the water and bats can swim. Okay. So they can, they can swim. The problem is they can't get out of the pool. Oh, so, so you can actually make your, your pool, or your pond bat friendly by installing an escape ramp oh. um, that has like closed sides for this little ramp. Will, so they, anything fi- that- will they find it? Like, will they yeah, usually, eventually? Usually they do. Yeah. Okay. Cause they'll like kind of, swim to the edge of the pool and kind of swim around the edge. So as long as it's on the edge and has closed sides, they can get up it. I yep. am going to Google swimming bat after this. It's space. really fun to watch. <laughs> it's kind of crazy how they can, it's kind of like flying in the water, you know? Oh yeah. They got built in flippers sort of. Mm-hmm. Basically. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right, um, I'm going to take us off topic here. Uh, over to Ramona, and then to uh, Missy, and then to Paula, and then to Katie. So, Ramona, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Dr. Lear. Um, nice to meet you. I am just south of you. I'm south of Albuquerque in the Rio Grande Valley. So oh, my cool. question is a little bit like Liz's. And I've seen the bats at Carl's Bat at sunset, and it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but I... I'm about a quarter mile from the Rio Grande. I'm in Bosque Farms. So I'm about a quarter mile from the Rio Grande and there's irrigation ditches all around. And I have been considering putting up a bat house. Mm -hmm. Um, Any tips for doing that in New Mexico? Does it need to be really high? Should I just check out that bat conservation website? And I love the tip about night blooming flowers because that'll be easy to to add to my yard area. So just tips on a bat house for, for New Mexico area. Absolutely. So um, I'm glad you brought that up because there is a great resource online. Um, It's either online, like a PDF where you can buy it for like $10. It's called the bat house builders handbook. Um, And it has a lot of really great tips about, you know, bat house design, what color you should paint the house, depending on where you live. Um, since you're in a pretty hot area, we recommend lighter colors or, you know, lighter shades of any color, um, white or like a tan would be good. Cause you don't want to overheat the bat house. Um, so yeah, definitely like a lighter color. And then, um, usually the bigger the bat house, the better, the more chambers, the better because the bats can move around within the chambers. Um, if one chamber gets too hot, they can move to a cooler one or vice versa throughout the day. So, um, yeah, definitely check out the bat house builders handbook. Um, they, there's designs in there and then there's some, um, really great bat companies. Um, habitat for bats makes great bat houses, um, and bat conservation and management also are two, two really great companies that make great bat houses. What was that first company again, Dr. Lear? Habitat for Bats. Thank you. 
based out of Georgia. And then Bat Conservation and Management is the other one. And they, they're based out of, I think, believe, Pennsylvania. But they, they ship, you know, across the country. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to know, if anything was special in New Mexico. And the lighter color makes perfect sense. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks and good luck. Thanks and congratulations on your PhD. That's Thanks. awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, over to Missy. Go ahead, Missy. Hey, what is the life expectancy of a bat? The most common bat in the United States. Ooh, the life expectancy? Yes. Oh, I love this question. It's one of my other favorite bat facts. So the bats we have around here in the U.S., um, 30 to 40 years is, wow. is what? And the max, the maximum is I believe was it forty two years? A bat in Siberia, yeah, and they knew it was that old because somebody caught it, you know, way back when and banded it, and then a researcher was it forty one years later caught that same bat, and because it was banded, they could tell it was that bat. Um, yeah, so the bats we have around the U.S. Ten, I'd say ten to twenty years, probably on average. Um, and it's really interesting because if you think about most bats, you know, they're, they're small animals. They have very high metabolisms. Yeah. I was going to, uh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm just stunned. They live. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Lear. No, no, that you, you, you're right to be stunned because they actually defy one of the kind of commonly accepted rules that small body size and high metabolism means short lifespan, right? If you think about rodents, bats are not rodents. Um, but if you think about those small animals, they tend to live two to three years, right? Bats can live super long lives and they actually, they they can resist their, the degradation of their DNA, which is what causes aging. They also don't really get cancer. They don't seem to get cancer as nearly as much as us or other organisms. So there's a lot of research going into, can we study the genome or the immune systems of bats to find, you know, a cure for cancer or the, the cure to, to live long lives, you know, the, the uh, hundred, 300 year, but you know, human, maybe someday it's possible. Hmm. So the vampire stories were onto something. Yeah, I, exactly. And, <laughs> and it's really cool. It's not just about living long. It's the, you hear lifespan and also health span is another term. So, you know, you could be 300 years old, but if you're, you know, move at 300 what's what's the point and so if you can live a long healthy life which bats seem to be able to do i think that's it. congratulations on your phd thank you so much thank you missy that was a great question i'm so glad you asked i'm just stunned i because that's what i was yep. going to say is that and you, you did a better job of explaining it than I did because I swear I teach the kids like a small organisms generally don't live right. as, as long and yeah. that breaks they all break. the rules. It does. Yeah, they do. They're pretty, pretty amazing animals. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I got to scoop my brain back into my head here. Uh, <laughs> who was next? Uh, pa Paula was next. Go ahead, Paula. Hi, hi, good evening, Dr. Lear. It's exciting. Um, I you. sort of uh, grew up as a kid in a swimming pool who had bats come hit her head as I swam yeah. at <laughs> night. So, uh, but I yeah. thought it was pretty cool, but it didn't bother me. My question is, why Why have that had that misnomer of blind as a bat, yet they can see? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, how far can they bat see? Because uh, we always notice they fly around. We live in a um, we lived in an open area, so we see cornfield and they'd be. <laughs> and I have a lot of night blooming flowers, but uh, and I can understand why we see so many of them. And it always fly in that figure eight. So mm. you're kind of wondering is that something that they're doing, you know, with a kind of like a you know sonic mm -hmm. thing where they're going around, or are they or they actually can see, and how far can they see? Yeah. So oh, that's a great question about like how that that myth or that saying came up. I think the blind as a bat saying kind of emerged because, you know, most bats are nocturnal. So they're flying at night. A lot of or a lot of bats do live in caves, which are, you know, pitch black inside. Um, and so I think people, because they, they're out at night, people thought bats don't need to be able to see because there's no light to see with. Um, so I think that's where that came from. But like I said, all bats have eyes and 
all bats can see. Um, some bat species do use echolocation. Um, so most of the bats, you know, we have here in the U.S., they're all echolocating species. Um, and that I, I, I'm, that's actually a great question about how far they can see. I'm not actually sure 100 percent how like the distance they can see um, with their eyes, but they do have better night vision than we do. Um, they see, you know, better at night. Um, some bats, like fruit bats, have can see in the UV range, so they can see that spectrum because fruit often, you know, reflects in that kind of spectrum. Um, and so, yeah, they're they're pretty cool. Um, and with echolocation, you you were asking about that <clears throat> that figure eight, and they're kind of flying around that pattern because they're hunting insects. So it's I think that kind of helps them navigate and helps them hone in on where the insects are. But yeah, I love watching bats at night. They're they flip yeah, around. it's fascinating. We used to see them come out almost like at you know twilight. You could see yeah. it was getting dusky, and uh, yep. and it was just fascinating. And um, I, 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 is there any concern for them as far as uh, their populations dwindling? Especially like I live in Connecticut. I mean, yeah, is it you know with the pesticides and stuff like that? Does that really um, you know affect? Yeah, yeah that's a. The pesticide question is a really interesting one because um, I think most of the effects of pesticides are longer term effects and they're more like systemic effects. So we do know um, in some bat species when the moms ingest um, insects that or you know have residues of these pesticides on them, uh, the mom can actually pass the pesticide residues onto their babies in their milk, um, which you know can have health effects. Also, um, pesticides in the male bats can reduce sperm count um, in these insect feeding bats. Um, so I think these are more, it's not going to like outright kill the bats, but it might long-term affect their populations. Um, and in terms of, yeah, in terms of the U.S. and North American bats, white nose syndrome is a huge, huge thing that has impacted bat populations here. Um, white nose syndrome is a it's caused it's a disease caused by a fungus that was introduced, we think, from um, Europe or Asia and brought over, um, not knowingly brought over to a cave in New York State. Um, and it spread that fungus spread from there to basically all across the US, up into Canada, and it's killed millions and millions of bats um, in the US alone. So it's there's a lot of research going into studying white nose syndrome and how we can, you know, protect bats from it. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking my questions and congratulations again on your PhD. It's a thank it's you. A subject. Thank you again. Yep. Thanks. Great. Well, great, great question. We've got some uh, dogs chiming in that they love the question too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Like they're active participants. Yeah, there's uh, somebody at the door. They are. Uh, they're telling us somebody's there. Um, Katie, you are on. You have the next question. Go ahead. Hello, it's Katie speaking. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, what a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Lear. Congratulations on your PhD. Thank you. Um, as a fellow conservation biologist and woman in STEM, um, I work with sharks, so my area is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But I'm just wondering, and apologies if I missed it, um, I missed the earlier part of the conversation, mm-hmm. um, but I know that you were talking about like all the different fields and possibilities if you are getting mm-hmm. into bat research or something. And I'm just wondering, do you have either a favorite field story or moment or, you know, piece of information, you know, that you got your data back or something that just completely blew your mind um, with your research. And apologies if you've already answered that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I I have not answered that. So that's a great question. And sharks are awesome. And I think they're also one of those kind of misunderstood groups of animals. So I'm really glad that you're on here too. Um, so yeah, field, oh gosh, field stories. There are so many great ones. Um, I think two come to mind. One is kind of a, a funny or not funny, but just a a weird one. Um, when I was in Australia, I actually studied in Australia for a year, 
um, in South Australia, and I was studying a critically endangered bat species. Um, and as part of my research, I got to go into one of only two maternity caves where the bats, this one species, gives birth to their pups What's going on um, and raises their pups. And this this cave is home oh. to about 40,000 bats in the peak of the summer. Zoom, and th- yes. these bats have been there for thousands of years. So oh. you can imagine what <laughs> happens done. over thousands of years with thousands of bats. The guano accumulates inside the cave. And as part of the work I was doing, I had to install um, these data loggers to record like the temperature inside the cave. And in order to install them, I had to get up into this one part of the cave that was basically I had to walk up this 30, 40 foot tall mound of bat guano to get to that spot. And yeah, it was um, a pretty, I have a picture of me on this giant pile of guano. What? And yes, it was, yeah, it was stinky. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, but I just, I don't know. I love the smell of bat guano. I know that sounds gross, but they have this very unique smell. And it just makes me happy when I know bats are around. So I just remember that, the, that moment, um, kind of the, one of the grossest parts of my job, but also the most fun. Um, and then another story, um, when I was an undergrad, I did a bat house project uh, for my honors thesis. And I basically was building different bat house types to see which type of bat house the bats preferred. And I put 18 different bat houses up in central Texas in the pecan orchards. We were working with pecan farmers. And within a week of putting up one of the bat houses, I went to go check up inside it with a you know flashlight during the day to see if there were any bats inside. And I was so surprised to see that there were not only adult bats, but there were little pink baby bats, newborn babies that were up in my bat house that I had made with my own hands. And I, I cried because I was just so like thrilled and so proud and couldn't believe it. So that, you know, as an undergrad, that was like, got me hooked if I could make a difference that way. And it, it, one of the best parts of my career. I see all the, thank you everyone. All the I know it's so cool. Awesome. It's so cool. Yeah. We, we need the heart emoji. We need, we need the heart emoji. Twitter. I know it's coming. <laughs> I have spies that have, they, they have the no with Twitter and my spies say that they're, we have new and new emojis coming. So <laughs> anyways, <laughs> What yeah, a great thanks. question, Katie. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, what thanks. a great, what a great, great answer too. Um, yeah. That's, that's thanks. great. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to go to K Communic, and then there's a couple questions that came in through DM. Um, so we'll go to K Munich. So good morning. Um, first, uh, congrats on your PhD, Dr. Lear. It sounds really fantastic what you're doing. Um, I'm just wondering about the influence of climate change on bat um, populations, e.g. Um, that we have more heat and maybe changing plant societies and how we can help them besides building bat houses, um, giving them some drinking opportunities and checking out um, if they are insectivores or if they are into nectar and planting night blooming flowers. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, awesome question. Thank you so much for for asking this because this is something that's you know on our mind as conservationists. Um, you know, the work we're doing now has to be resilient into the future, and that's that's hard to do, right? It's hard to to see far ahead. So, in terms of climate change, um, there's there are several things that we're seeing happen with bat populations. Um, definitely, those extreme heat events that you mentioned. Um, you know, heat is normal, but the the thing that we're seeing happen is we're seeing these extremes in heat happening more and more often. Um, and we're seeing that play out in places like Australia, where um, thousands of flying foxes you'll see in the news are literally falling dead from their roost trees um, from heat exhaustion. They're, they're dying from the heat. Um, so that's definitely a concern. Um especially for those bats that roost, you know, in trees kind of exposed to the elements. And then also you mentioned the plant communities and how climate change can affect 
bat. And that is a huge thing with the, for example, the endangered Mexican long-nosed bat that I'm working with now is that with climate change, their food plants, the agave plants, they are, um, the, the timing of their flowering is shifting a little bit. Um, and these are migratory bats. They migrate every year from central Mexico all the way up to the U.S. Southwest. And so if that timing of the agave bloom gets mismatched with the timing of the bat's migration, the bats are going to be migrating at a time when the agaves are not in bloom and there won't be any food. Um, or they might have to shift the timing of their migration to a less optimal time. Um, so yeah, we're seeing that. We're seeing um, you know, agave, the plant survival itself with these increased temperatures, increased drought. Um, you know, the plants are not surviving as well, which again affects the food resources for the bats. So yeah, it's definitely a lot of lot of, lot going on, but um, we've talked about some of those ways to help. Um, you know, supporting bats locally where you can by creating bat habitat. But um, you know, if you're kind of in an area you're not able to to do that bat habitat, like I'm renting a house right now, I can't you know put up a bat house in the yard. Um, what can you do? Um, a shameless plug, you know, you can support bat organizations that, that are doing conservation work and research, um, you know, donations, you know, we run on, on grants and funding. And so, you know, any donor amounts, any memberships, those really help organizations um, do the work. Um, so definitely, you know, that's an easy way. There's even some fun ways like adopting a bat. <laughs> you don't get a, unfortunately, don't get a real bat. Um, but, um, some groups like Bat Conservation International, we have this Adopt-A-Bat program, um, which is great for kids. You, um, basically donate, um, I forget how much it is now, like $30 or $50 and you get information about the bat, you get a plushy stuffed animal bat. Um, and that, you know, money then goes to, um, supporting the bat work. Um, so yeah, I think that's an easy way to get involved and then really sharing, sharing about bats. I think, you know, bats need all the positive PR they can get. And so if we can all start sharing one, you know, one bat fact we learned or one cool thing we, we heard about bats, it might seem little, but I think all of those together over time make a big difference. So yeah, I'll put that plug in. Yeah, if you're on the um, the bat, adopt a bat website right now, the stuffies are adorable. They are. <laughs> they are I'm, so adorable. They're really cute. What would you name your bat, Chris? Um, I don't, I, I uh, don't know. Put you on the spot. <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking um, like Biff, Biff the bat. That sounds cool. I like that. It's a good name. So I, you know, I, I read the book Silverwing by Kenneth Oppel. He's a Canadian uh, writer. Um, and he writes, he wrote a book series, uh, mm -hmm. Silverwing, um, where the main character is Shade. And uh, he went to look at the sun, which was forbidden. Um, and then he went on a journey and picked up some friends along the way. He got uh, blown off into the ocean and off course. And he met a bat named Marina. And mm -hmm. they had a, they went together. And I think, um, I think I might name the bat Shade uh, in, oh. in honor of, of, of that story because that's a story that kind of as a young as a young person reading it got me kind of hooked and like liking bats and so I think that's yeah. what I would do I love that's a great I, I love that I, I also read that those books growing up um so I, yeah I relate and Stella Luna obviously an obvious one but um I had a little Stella Luna stuffed um, plushie that had velcro wings um growing up and I just, I would carry it around like attached to my arm. Um, and of course read the book. So yeah. Oh, so, that's like, awesome. Bella Luna. Now, speaking of stuffies and things you might carry around, Dr. Lear, your bat fashion is on point. <laughs> I just have to tell you right now, like, you. um, your, your dresses, you have bat earrings. Um, I, yep. I think you even have a bat costume I've seen you in before. Yeah. I do. It's, it's kind of like Miss Frizzle, kind of Miss Frizzle, it but is. like batty. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's a really fun way to engage people, right? It's, I mean, you can go too far and be the, you know, the crazy bat lady, but I think to some degree that's good, right? It gets, it piques people's curiosity. Um, 
like I've actually made connections um, for like bat projects, like at the coffee shop, I'm wearing a bat shirt and somebody will comment on it. And they're like, oh, I wanted to put up a bat house and then we'll exchange contact info and, you know, we'll put up a bat house in their yard. So, yeah, I think it's just a really fun way to to get people interested. I if I was to wear earrings, I think I'd wear <laughs> bat earrings. I'll tell you that right now. Um, yeah. I'm well, in no rush to get my ears right? pierced, but I'll just tell you. So Yeah, but I think you totally could pull it off. I think you're <laughs> <lucky>. <laughs> What do you think, Chris? Do you you wear earrings sometimes? You'd look good in bat earrings. Well, Valentine's just passed, but my Oops. birthday is coming in April. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, okay. <laughs> Intent. <laughs> um, I think I think uh, is there any of our speakers still up that have a follow up question? Well, you're still you still have the ability to speak, so I'll give you a second to think about that. And one more call for questions from the audience. Uh, while you're thinking and while you're maybe wanting to think of a question, I'll I uh, one came in by DM and it was about hantavirus. Are you do you have to take precautions for hantavirus or is that not something from guano or from bats you have to worry about so much? Yeah, so I've never um I mean it's not associated with bats. It's okay. definitely I mean, I've been in areas where hantavirus is present, but not it's not from bats. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely. Thank goodness. Don't have to worry about that um, when you're on the field. That's more mice related. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yep. Yep. You know, I know that because there is, <laughs> there is a Canadian TV show called Rust Valley Restorers. It's very, anyways, oh. these, these two guys restore cars in the Shushwap part of BC and every time they pull a car out, that's like got mice nests inside it. And the one guy's got this gravelly voice. He's like, you're going to get hantavirus from that. So that's how I know yeah. it's from mice. Yep. Anyway. Yeah. And I think I'm actually Googling it because I'm, I'm not a, a disease person. That's not my background. Oh, yeah. Okay. They like learn new things. And I guess rodents, bats and shrews. So I guess, yeah, but this one's from Brazil. So yeah, I don't know if any U.S. bats can have it. It's a really good question. Hmm. Yeah. I, do you wear respirators or anything when you go into those caves? Like, um, or do you so, just walk straight in there? Yeah. So <laughs> I was laughing cause that one, that the guano picture of me and with that mound of guano, I was not wearing a respirator. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I've been because it's not, it's not like the bats themselves necessarily. It's, um, you know, stuff can grow in bat poop or rodent poop. Mm-hmm. you know, cat poop, everybody gets moldy. Yeah. And so, yeah, you definitely should wear, if you're going into a cave with thousands of bats, it's good practice um, to, to, to do that. Um, and with, you know, with COVID and with zoonotic diseases um, becoming more of a thing worldwide, we are, we bat scientists and scientists in general are trying to be really aware that, you know, one, we don't contract anything from the animals we're studying, but also that we don't give anything from us to them, right? Because, you know, we can give our germs to them. And so, yeah, we're really pushing within the bat community and wildlife community in general to really start wearing proper PPE or that protective equipment, you know, gloves, masks, when you're in close contact so that none of us, you know, get anything. Bats, people, animals, nobody. That is smart. Yeah. I I mean, it's common sense. We just never used to do it as much. Now it's like, maybe we should just... To keep everyone safe, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Last call for speakers or questions. Well, I was just going to ask like, if you get bit by a bat, mm-hmm. like, is a tetanus shot kind of a, a recommended thing? Because I know if you get bit by anything, really, you should go get that tetanus shot if you haven't had it within ten years. Tetanus. That's interesting. I'm not sure about tetanus, but rabies. Like, definitely the recommendation if you get bit by a bat or any of those rabies potential rabies vectors is to get the um, the post exposure rabies shots. Um, like I said, chances are it's probably not, doesn't have rabies, but if you encounter a sick animal, it's more likely to be sick with something. Um, so yeah, if you get bit by a bat, definitely report it and, you know, go get the shots. Hmm. We had, I had to have, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Lear. I'm so sorry. I was just saying it's very rare, but not something you want to play with, you know? Yeah. I had to have my rabies shot, Chris, when I went with the kids to Costa Rica. Because they mm-hmm. were worried about the monkeys biting the kids. Mm. Yeah, monkeys um, are cute, but they um, like to bite too. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
we yep. turns out it was the scorpions that got the kids anyways but anyways that's another story um <laughs> uh paula your hand was up go ahead yeah i had a quick question about a uh, bat guamo i i seen that in the uh, um you know like when you go to the the uh plant store and it's like yeah. they said that's the best thing you could feed your plants <laughs> but i have to ask you you said you love the smell of it what does it smell <laughs> like is it like you know fresh manure or what is it like <laughs> I'm sitting here going, or is it just like dog poop? <laughs> yeah. No, it de- oh, gosh. It does not smell like dog poop. Definitely. No, <laughs> not that crazy. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Because I we know about that here. It's pretty not it, good. It's not good. <laughs> no. So it, that's a really good question because um, different bat species, like their bodies smell different and their guano also can smell different. So like pe- bat scientists always say, oh, I, I smell the, the Mexican free tail bats. I smell them around because they have a very distinct kind of like musky smell. It's like, it's not bad. I don't know how to describe it. It's like a musty smell. Um, and, and yeah, bat guano is a good fertilizer. So, you know, that is I, definitely people buy it online, I think, um, for their gardens. Yep. Yeah, it is. And it's expensive too, because it's, organic. It but they say it's great. They say it's the best thing you could really use. So yeah. Pretty, but, pretty potent stuff. Yeah. yeah, it really is. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, Dr. Lear, thank you so much for being our guest tonight for Spaces Unleashed, uh, giving up your time to talk to us about what you do with bats, your research, your work in the STEM field, um, and with girls, and and also answering everybody's questions. Absolutely. Thank you. I Like I said, I could talk bats all day, so thanks for having me. <laughs> Perfect. So we're at the end of today's show. Um, one, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Lear, for talking to us tonight. Thank you to all of our speakers who were brave enough to ask questions and uh, the folks who DM'd us. Um, Dr. Lear, best wishes in the future. The sky's, the sky's the limit. It really is, literally. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Um, if you want to check out those of us, that were, those of you who are in the audience, we have Pet Chat on Saturday. Um, come join us for some really silly chat about Bunsen and Beaker and your pets. There'll be some games and some prizes. Next week in Spaces Unleashed Science Chat, we have the Amoeba Sisters, who run an enormous YouTube account. Um, they're going to be on chatting about what they do for science education with kids through adorable cartoons and biology. Okay, take care, everybody. We'll see you next week, maybe this weekend on Saturday. And again, thanks, Dr. Lear. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Ending in three, two, one. <laughs>